Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, a show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. Cool, cool. All right, here we go. Hey, Maya. So, so nice to meet you. really appreciate you coming on the show. It means the world to me. Thanks. I'm really happy to be here. Excited to be talking to everybody today. Yeah, we're excited to have you. We're going to go into a bunch of different topics. But of course, before we before we dive too deep, we always love to get a little bit of background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the moment. Yes. Well, I feel like what I'm doing now has kind of been like a long journey that um, is kind of coming full cycle for me. So I feel like I really started um, this portion of my career like 20 years ago when I was a volunteer firefighter for Four Mile and Gold Hill. Um, And that was just a very compelling experience for me. And it really um, kind of piqued my interest in going further into emergency services. And so I ended up becoming a paramedic and I worked as a paramedic in Denver for about seven years. And that was an incredible learning experience um, with incredible people. And eventually I realized that I did not want to sit in an ambulance for the rest of my life, even though it was an amazing experience. Um, But I was really, really drawn to the type of people who work in emergencies, you know, that are very action oriented, decisive, caring, creative people. And um, so I pursued a master's in public administration and emergency management. And right when I finished that, the flood happened in 2013. So that was just like this natural transition into going back to the communities that I started in, in Four Mile and Gold Hill and really working with those communities, um, but being able to offer something to them. Now, you know, I had now multiple years of background in emergencies and emergency management. And it felt really good to be able to bring more to the community than I was learning from them at the beginning. So that's how I ended up where I am. And it's been seven years now that I've been working up there in watershed related work. And it's been awesome. Very cool. Um, Have you always been like the person who's like calm during the crazy scenario or is that something you kind of like adopted like later on in your life I think that um I do think I have a calm personality to start with but I feel like a lot of that is learned and when you have skills to bring to a crazy situation and you you are able to act with um purpose then you have you bring more calm I think and I feel like everybody can have access to that hmm I don't know. Some people get really anxious during crazy <laughs> situations. I know I'm weird because I mean, I get injured all the time. I've like cut my finger off. I've cracked my head open and I'm all oh, people are always like find it weird that I'm like when stuff like that happens, I'm always like cracking jokes. So like, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but uh, I don't know. I try to try to stay calm during the storm to be most effective. But yeah. uh, anyways, yeah, thanks for it's sharing. So- coping mechanisms. Jokes are yeah. one of them, I think. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely try to lead towards comedy. I mean, what is the two types of like plays? It was like tragedies or comedies, right? And the comedies were the ones with the, with the happy endings. I don't know. Yeah, cool. So let's, let's talk about your experience at four mile watershed. Was that after your work at being a paramedic or before that? Mm -hmm. No, it was after it was. um, So after the flood, uh, the state, the state of Colorado decided that it wanted to approach flood recovery from um, kind of a grassroots community perspective. And so they helped um, flood affected communities develop these watershed coalitions. And so the four mile watershed coalition grew out of that because four mile had a wildfire in 2010. And then it had Um, some flooding in 2011 related to that burn area. And then it had the big flood in 2013. So it was just like a really, um, the natural resources there, the river corridors were just really damaged. And so Four Mile got its own watershed coalition and I started working for them in 2015. 
So let's just briefly explain again, we've talked about this multiple times on this show, but like what is a watershed and then what would the role of like a watershed coalition like be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. A watershed is a geographical um, description basically of um, an area where all of the rain or snowpack drains into a certain system. So like a certain catchment area and they can be small it's it's kind of like there's these nested watersheds you know they can be really small and then they are in bigger ones and bigger ones and then eventually around here you you're part of the we are part of the south platte basin okay so where, where does is that like so coming from like, like the continental divide kind of thing yeah so the boulder creek watershed that we that we four mile creek is a tributary to boulder creek and okay. the four mile creek watershed is essentially from the continental divide all the way down through the mountains through the city of boulder lafayette Louisville, and a little bit into erie where and then it confluences with the saint brain river the saint brain mm -hmm. creek and then it flows into the south platte river okay um, yeah very cool so did the boulder watershed kind of like now encompass the four mile watershed is it like the mm -hmm. whole county now um, it's, it's, um, so the Boulder Creek watershed is basically Southern Boulder County and a little bit of Gilpin and Jefferson County where South Boulder Creek, um, the South Boulder Creek watershed includes a little bit of those other counties as well. But yes, the four mile, the f eventually after we were finished with flood recovery, which really just ended like last year, um, we decided to expand because Boulder Creek really didn't have a watershed group that was okay. looking at it. And there was just a lot of opportunity to, to kind of scale up the work that we were doing and look at a, a broader base of the community and also the landscape. So what is the, what did that like recovery process look like? You're talking about almost 10 years. So you're talking about like eight years of recovery. So what would that like entail? Well, the first part of recovery, um, is very chaotic and it is yeah. a lot of, yeah, it's really a lot of assessment of where the damages are, who needs what, you know, and it, and then it takes a long time for federal funding to get to state, to get to local. So it takes a long time for the recovery funds to trickle down also. But the first part of, of recovery processes, I think are really those damage assessments and really understanding what happened, where it happened and who it happened to. Hold on. Can we actually, can we talk about that for anyone who's not listening, who's not aware of like the 2013 flood? Like why yeah. did it happen? What damage caused it? Is it related mm -hmm. to changing climate type stuff? Like mm -hmm. what exactly happened in 2013? Yeah. 2013 was a flood um, that we hadn't really seen in our lifetimes, the scale of in Colorado. And it, it essentially was from, it, the whole front range was affected really, uh, you know, from Fort Collins all the way down through Colorado Springs. Um, and it, it was a massive, massive flood for those who weren't here. And essentially it rained for multiple days and what normally gets absorbed into the soils um, was no longer able to be absorbed because the soil became completely saturated. And so after multiple days of rain, we really started to see um, this scouring of these mountain river corridors where they, the earth just couldn't hold any more water. And so it just started pouring down um, these corridors and, and it took a lot of um, debris with it. And debris is trees, boulders, different sizes of sediments. And so, you know, you combine that with like the velocity of the slopes we have, the, the, the slope, because we have such steep slopes in the mountains, you know, the velocity of that water coming down is so fast. And then you get all that debris mixed in it and the damage that happens to people, to people's homes and structures in those river corridors is, and in those floodplains is really extreme. And then when you get down into the plains, all of that sediment and debris gets deposited in different areas along the way. And that itself, is damaging. I mean, these are all natural processes. This, That's what I was gonna this say. happens. Yeah, this is normal. This is, n these are normal um, geological processes that happen. Mm -hmm. But when you have the human element mixed in there, 
that's when it becomes a disaster really yeah i guess so so i know how like if there's forest fires that can be like good for the forest i guess the idea being like every so often the system needs to like reboot and like move all the nutrients around throughout the forest and that's what the 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 flood might do but you know i the idea is we're going to be seeing more stuff like this Mm -hmm. happening in the future i guess is is there do you know why floods are more likely to occur because of changing climate stuff Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely some, there's definitely um, increasing temperatures that are happening over prolonged periods of time. And um, so this, this comes with more extreme weather events that are difficult to predict. So we are trying to plan, we collectively, you know, locally, regionally, nationally, and globally are trying to plan for these unexpected weather, extreme weather events, which is difficult, but there are definitely ways that we can um, develop more resilient natural systems or, or really encourage the, nat- the resilient natural systems that already exist and build more, na- more resilient community systems as well. So an example of that when we did flood recovery was really trying to reconnect the the river channel to the floodplain. So, you know, it might seem logical that you would want to build up the banks of a river to try and keep the water in, but actually you want this nice sloping of a floodplain so the water can raise, spread out, slow down, drop its sediment and and cause less damage that way. So um, a lot of what we did in the recovery process in the rivers was reconnect the floodplain. And, um, and yeah, you're squinting like, well, yeah, like what's, hard. what's a flood? Like, what is a yeah. floodplain? I just know it as like, okay, if my house is in the floodplain, like, uh Oh, like I'm in mm-hmm. trouble. Like it has to be built up on stilts or something. Yeah. So, so what, another way that we can refer to the floodplain is like the active river corridor. So I wish that I had like some drawing implements right now, but, but essentially when you look at a river, you see it in its channel, but those water, the, the volume of water in that river is always changing. You know, we get runoff and the water's really high. And then in, in the fall, we have these really low rivers, but the whole area that the river wants to use, including flood flows is really what we call the active river corridor. And that is the floodplain. So we really should not be building structures in the floodplain or, um, yeah, I mean, we, (laughs) we have a lot, we have a lot, we have a lot. And because floods don't big floods don't happen that often. And so you can have a whole generation that misses a flood and those are great building areas because they're flat, but Um, But there are some really innovative ways of dealing with that. And the city of Boulder has a good one with the bike path that goes all along, you know, the Boulder Creek and that area can be flooded. The whole bike path can be flooded, but not really damaged. Um, And so we're kind of, we have some infrastructure there and we're using it, um, but it also allows for flooding to happen there without significant damage. And I think that is an example of a good way of living in, you know, that sharing that natural system, I guess. Yeah. Do you have any idea like what percentage of homes are built in floodplains, like in the U S to like, do people pay attention to this stuff at all? Well, FEMA pays attention to that and there's national flood insurance programs that pay attention to that. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know what the percentage is, but one thing that happened after the flood was some of those really damaged properties were bought back. So they, it was federal funds that was used to purchase some of these properties that are now owned by Boulder County. So they're Boulder County open space, but nothing can be built there anymore. So they essentially are kind of given back to the river to have that space to use and move around. And, and that means that, you know, nobody is going to build a house and be unsafe there again. So cool. that is a positive program also, I think. Cool. All right. So now we've got a little bit of background on how the water system works. Can we, can you explain the Boulder Creek watershed plan and like the minutia of like how the Creek restoration actually like works on a day-to-day basis? 
Yeah, well, there were multiple plans that were developed after the flood um, for different drainages. And a lot of those plans were developed separately because there's different communities living in those areas and they have different values. Um, so the stream restoration has, is basically finished now. Um, in most areas, there is definitely some stream restoration still happening um, by the city of Boulder, I think, and Boulder County open space. Um, essentially what happens is you get all the stakeholders together, whether that's private landowners, um, county, public landowners, other interest groups like Trout Unlimited or something like that, and you kind of compile everybody's values and then you do this river design to try and, you know, integrate as many of those values as you can. And then you acquire the funding to do the work and you hire contractors to go in with excavators into the stream and, and rebuild the river by stabilizing the banks, doing grading, um, planting a lot of vegetation. And, and a lot of things, this is all stuff that would happen naturally over time. Um, but we aren't very patient with that kind of thing. And, and also, you know, there are roads and bridges and houses that are near the river. And so and, and water quality, you know, there's a lot of water diversions coming out of the stream. And so you want to minimize the amount of sediment that's rushing into the stream. So there are a lot of good reasons to do stream restoration. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Knowing what you know all about like the, the water system, like how far would you recommend we build structures away from like streams? I've heard a bunch of people say about like different things, like it should be like a half a mile away or yeah. 800 feet or something. This your personal well, thought. Yeah, no, it's different in every area because of the topography and um, the river system. But actually, the state has recently finished new floodplain mapping, um, which includes Boulder County. And so I don't have the website on me right now, but you can actually go and see and you can zoom in on this interactive map and find your house in there and see where you are in the floodplain. Um, and probably most homeowners already know this because you have to get flood insurance if you're living in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it differs everywhere. But it is it is a good thing to be aware of that just because your house is dry now doesn't mean that you aren't potentially at risk to different hazards. Yeah. So if they like were to like build it up a few feet, would that like fix the problem or would then like the foundation get swept by like water? Um, no, building it up um, multiple feet is one of the ways to, um, is one of the kind of risk mitigation measures that people mm -hmm. use when they live in the floodplain. Um, and that also depends on the specific floodplain mapping for those different areas. Um, but I mean, there's always risk also, but mitigating right. risk is what we try to do. It's, it's the same if you live in the forest, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, at risk of wildfire. I mean, it's the same in life. If people, we yeah. have a very relaxing life. We try to, I mean, a lot of people are very stressed out, but we try to live life without being in danger. But I mean, this yeah. life is not, it's not a risk free, you know, especially if you yeah. want to like achieve things, whether it be living in an amazing house or going off and striving to do amazing things or doing emergency work like you and having a very fulfilled life of service. Um, so let's, let's talk about, um, mine reclamation and how this affects like watershed health and what you've been doing with like these abandoned mines in our, in our County. Yeah, this was something, the abandoned mine lands portion was something that we did not intend to get involved in. Um, but, uh, there was a lot of gold and silver and other heavy metal mining in this area, um, which is an interesting part of our history. And um, there are a lot of negative watershed impacts that come from extracting those resources from the earth. Giant hole in the earth. Giant hole and just the, um, those when once those um, minerals and metals get exposed to oxygen, they, they can start um, changing and becoming, they can leach into our water systems, into our rivers and, and potentially cause aqua, aquatic health issues or human health issues. And so um, 
the fire really, the fire in 2010 really destabilized a lot of those mine waste piles that were in Four Mile because all of the vegetation was now gone. So those sediments were no longer stable and held kind of onto the earth. And so every time it rained or there was runoff, that stuff runs into the creeks. Um, and so there were multiple areas in Four Mile Canyon where we really couldn't do stream restoration without addressing the mine waste that was there also. And that is a whole different design process and permitting process that happens. But I mean, we were really trying to build these resilient river corridors and we had to do the mine reclamation in order to um, kind of obtain that goal or reach, meet those outcomes. And so, um, and so we did, and, and we partnered with the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, who, who owns land up there, and also with the EPA, who oversees a lot of um, mine land restoration on um, private lands, and also with Trout Unlimited has an abandoned mine lands team as well, which is an amazing resource that we as communities have here as well. And so really it's very similar to stream restoration in that you want to stabilize the sediment. And so you really want to get good vegetation growing on there. So mm. there's a lot of like trying to rebuild the soil so that it can grow good vegetation and the vegetation is what stabilizes those soils. Very so, interesting work. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're doing this. Some, someone needs to do it. If, Cause if we just go in and just dig a giant hole and then just leave. Is that like what happened? Like would people, would they own, was it public lands that they were mining on or how, how did it work? And uh, then they just ditch and yeah. just leave, leave a just giant hole in the middle of the forest. Well, back in the day, you know, they patented this. So this is like the late 1800s and the early 1900s, you know, in, in Colorado, this is when the settlers were actively, you know, moving the native, really pushing the native Americans off of their land. And then, mm -hmm. you know, kind of taking these lands and doing these extractive processes on them. And yes, a lot of it was just literally blasting or digging these holes and shoveling that out of the holes. Um, but then there was this need to process that ore. And so mills were built and they used other, um, other things like cyanide sometimes to process the ore so they could extract the, the precious metals from it. And, and so some of the mine waste piles that you see when you're hiking around are, is literally just the stuff that was dug out of the holes. And then others called mine tailings is the processed ore, which is usually a little bit more toxic um, because it has other chemicals mixed in. But yeah, then, you know, the gold rush ended and people well, moved gone. on with their lives and yeah. that stuff. And over a hundred years, you know, things got covered up and vegetation grew, but those holes were still there. Yeah. And during the four mile fire, um, it was a real hazard to firefighters because there are hundreds of mine shafts everywhere that they could fall into. And, and that really started its own process where the state has now been closing, you know, putting grates and, and closing those holes um, all over Boulder County and really all over Colorado for, for um, public safety and yeah. firefighter safety if it burns. Well, we just show up and we just take stuff, uh, we suck the resources out and leave. Um, wild. I mean, I hope we don't continue to uh, do that. So, so you're saying the, the best way to mitigate the health risks of these, we'll call them mine holes, is to plant vegetation around them. Is that right? The best way. So the soils are there, the contaminated soils are there, and we can't just like haul them all off to somewhere. And so, yes, the, the best way to stabilize the soil. So to keep them on the land, instead of running into the water is to have healthy native vegetation growing on them. Mm -hmm. But, um, if there isn't like some topsoil on top of these contaminated soils, you really can't get vegetation to grow. And so there's a process of adding different aggregates kind of called capping the mine where you put, um, yeah, different sized aggregates on top of it. And then you put some compost or soil or something that will encourage vegetation to grow. And then we reseeded it. Yeah. And then um, we let mother nature do her work and 
let that happen. Yeah, hopefully it continues to to heal that wound that is a giant yeah. hole in the earth. I'm just sitting here thinking like 2010 fire, 2013 flood, crazy fires last two summers ago. Like we like, are we just we're just going to be due for these big disasters again? Um, I guess. How do you recommend people like prepare? Let's go with like mentally for something like this. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, hmm, that's really not my area of expertise. <laughs> but, you know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, yeah. I'm like another flood. Like it's, it's going to come at some point. Or was that like, they called it like the hundred year flood, the 2013 one, didn't they? Yeah. But you know, floods can happen. I mean, there it's difficult to predict and we can have more isolated ones or larger ones. And, and if we have more fires, then we're more prone to more flooding. So I think we do need to prepare ourselves mentally to be um, more resilient to these types of events. And, um, you know, it's interesting watching my kids grow up with a totally different perspective. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think a lot of it honestly is like community cohesion. Like we have to just build communities that we can, where we can rely on each other. And that's like on an individual and neighborhood level and also like inter-community level, you know, where we share resources and where we ask for help and where we, you know, are, are leveraging the skills and resources that each other have. And we're really connected in a way where um, when something does happen, you know, we have, we have um, networks, I guess, Mm -hmm. because we can't all have everything to do what we need after a disaster. And so I think, I think it really is about building community. Yeah, that seems to be the answer to, to, to most of the issues. And the problem is everyone's really strong headed and thinks that they have the right answer. So I'm trying to, you know, ask everyone what they think and see if we can like kind of put some pieces together. But yeah, no, the reason is, is like my generation, your, your kids generation, we don't have a, a stable natural system to rely on. We've like entered the Anthropocene where it's like up to us to do this mitigation to make sure that it works because we've just taken a bunch of chunks out of the natural system. But instead of, yeah, instead of like pressing you on like mental ideas that aren't your, your expertise, let's talk about something you know a lot about, which is like the relationship between wildfire mitigation and like watershed management. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, how do these two like relate yeah. when it comes to stopping fires and keeping right. the streams healthy? Right. So this is an area where, you know, when you're building your own personal resilience to climate change and stuff there, there are certain, you know, physical actions that you can take. Um, if you live in a forested area, um, there's also effects from wildfire if you don't live in a forested area, if you're downstream, you know, in an urban area, like smoke impacts and stuff like that. And so everybody is or will be affected by this at some point in time. So um, one thing that has happened, and, and people already probably know this story, but, you know, over the last hundred years, we have really suppressed wildfire. So wildfire can be destructive. And so we have awesome firefighting um, personnel and we put out fires and um, we've been doing that for a long time. And it's allowed our forests to grow overly dense because fire is a natural part of the ecosystem. And many of our forests, most of our forests out West have kind of evolved, co-evolved with wildfire. And it's an, it's an important part of um, renewing the system, renewing the forests. It's an important part of keeping growth in check and, um, you know, bringing nutrients back into soil. And, you know, some, some seeds from trees and like understory vegetation only are released with fire. And so when we totally remove it from our ecosystems, we're in this place now where we're feeling the effects of that. And so a lot of the forest management that is done now, the thinning, um, is a way to try to mimic the effects of wildfire. Um, the thinning of forests, like we cut down trees. 
we cut down trees. Yes. Because so they're overly dense right now. So like we live in, in these lower areas, closer to Boulder, it's predominantly a ponderosa pine forest and ponderosas did not grow super dense. They grew spaced out with meadows in between and, Hmm. um, and sometimes there were clumps of them and sometimes there were a couple individual ones, but they were not super dense. And we would have seen like these really large old ponderosas that grow, but now there's a lot of um, smaller ones fighting for resources and they don't have the space and the sunlight and the nutrients to grow to these large old trees. And so part of forest management is going in and trying to um, thin parts of the forest to create some of these more open meadow systems so that we can have healthier forests that are better, that are more conducive to habitat, to wildlife, um, birds, and and are also more resilient when wildfire comes through. So if the fire comes through, it stays on the ground, it burns the grass fuels and some of the maybe baby trees or something like that but it's not going to turn into a huge crown fire where it's burning, moving through the treetops and burning all the trees. So that is one method of forest management. The the ultimate method though, is to really get fire back on the ground. And whether this is managing natural wildfire to let it burn in certain areas um, or doing prescribed fire where we are intentionally putting controlled fire on the ground, you know, that, that really needs to happen. And Mm -hmm. it's scary and it's, it causes a lot of apprehension for people, but um, you know, it's a normal part of the ecosystem that, that, that we have physically removed from the ecosystem. That's part of the Anthropocene. And so Mm -hmm. now we're trying to kind of, um, fix i guess what our impacts yeah well i'm picking up on like a very interesting dichotomy that you personally have to deal with in the sense that you're like an emergency mitigation specialist so you're there to make sure that like when stuff's going really wrong you're either cleaning up or you're making people feel safe or you're directly helping them but at the same time you're trying to think about like what the the natural world actually wants to be like, which doesn't think in terms of like emergency act now, it thinks in terms of like hundreds of years. So how do you kind of balance these two ways of thinking when you're working? Oh, that is my favorite question that you've asked so far, because I thought you might like that. Yeah, this is so hard. These time scales, the, the human time scale versus like the geologic earth time scale is completely different. And um, you know, Very humans different. want things to happen quickly and, um, nature doesn't happen quickly. And so it is very difficult. And I feel like this is some of the collective learning that we all have to do where we just, um, have more patience with nature and in, in, in allowing nature to go through the cycles that she needs to go through and, and in order for us to have healthier ecosystems and healthier communities. Um, and I think this is going to be part of the collective learning that happens with more and more extreme weather events um, and how we respond to them. It's, it's interesting to see that play out, but yeah, it's definitely the time scales is is so hard to reconcile sometimes. Yeah. I'm trying to think of ways to get people to think in terms of, you know, I love Simon Sinek's theory of like the infinite game that you just, as long as you just keep playing, it's not about these short-term quarterly goals. It's about a long-term vision, but it's certain people. I mean, we're conditioned to think very short-term and I don't know, there's, just I think having communication like you said community is good so yeah speaking of of short term uh how do you guys get funding for these projects is it all supported by the the city government the county government like how does it work yeah funding is really a combination of a lot of different things um it disaster recovery is largely federal is federal funding um but also state funding as well Mm -hmm. and and then you know the counties uh, there's 
definitely a lot of local funding that comes in, in there too. It, really all these different funding pieces leverage other funding pieces and you have to like mishmash it all together to get the work done that you want. Um, and that still is the case. We are really fortunate right now. I guess maybe one of the silver linings of all of, I don't, I don't think fortunate is the right word actually, because you say of about climate the climate change. change. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I think we're finally getting to a point where we're realizing that we have to invest in ecosystems and community resiliency and climate change, honestly. And it, it feels like in Colorado, for sure, um, the legislature is has dedicated more money towards forest and wildfire health, forest health and wildfire and watershed health. And um, I think we're seeing that at the federal level as well. And so that's really awesome because that will allow us to work more with communities, mobilize more people, get more work done on the ground, and hopefully will help us build, you know, that type of those types of like interrelated social and ecological systems that are more resilient to climate change as we move forward. Uh, do you have any particular stories that stand out in your mind where you're doing this work where you were able to either, maybe you felt like a connection to like the forest, like the forest was thanking you or like, there's anyone, like any person, I don't know. I just wanted to give you both options, not just try and force it to be human. Cause we know we love our nature as well. Any stories um, that stand yeah. out in your mind? Maybe. Yeah. I can imagine you doing some work in like 2013 and coming back eight years and seeing this like thriving ecosystem, you know? Yeah. I mean, one, one thing that happened just this year was um, I've been working with a landowner. We did a restoration project on a river in 2017 and, you know, he lives kind of far from where, from the river where that was. And he saw it, I think maybe this year. So that's four years. And, he was like, oh my gosh, it looks so overgrown down there. And at first I felt like, oh no, he doesn't like it. But then I felt like, yes, that is exactly what it's supposed to look. That is a thriving ecosystem right there. That is a riparian area that has huge tall willows and all this habitat in there. And it's so good. It shades the fish and the birds have food there. And that is what it's supposed to look like, a messy mm -hmm. riparian healthy stream area and and overgrown and so cool. that actually felt like a real compliment afterwards hell yeah no thanks for sharing uh what was the reception like at your most recent like living with fire talk did like a bunch of people show up and were they like kind of receptive mm, to it yes so that we've been working a lot with the town of gold hill and they are an amazing community they are um a very um a very close community and they are they have a lot of risk up there too from wildfire and so we've been doing a lot of um wildfire we have some wildfire mitigation some forest restoration projects happening up there but this living with fire was more of an event to um address the so social aspects that you were mm -hmm. talking about before where it's like let's Let's imagine what Gold Hill looks like if we do nothing. Like in five years from now, what if we do nothing? Like what are the, what are the potential um, outcomes of that? And we went kind of through a brainstorming process like that. And then let's reimagine what we want it to look like in five years. You know, this is five years is short term. So, but let's do some imagining about what that looks like, considering you know, the wildfire threat. And, and that was just a beautiful brainstorming process about, you know, where everybody would like the town, the community, the ecosystem to be. Um, and so that was a great process in itself. We haven't really gotten to phase two yet, which is where, how do we get from here to there? Um, but that's coming up next. And I think that um, you know, we're going to do a similar thing in Coal Creek Canyon. And I think there's a lot of communities that, that would benefit from, you know, collectively visioning like that. Totally. Well, Maya, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. I really appreciate all the work you're doing. And I'm not saying this to be rude, but I wish we didn't need yes. you. 
you know <laughs> if we lived in rest it seems like the reason we have we we can't we call them emergencies and it's just part it's part of this long-term natural system if we built communities that were resilient that were ready for this be like oh another flood you know no big deal that's a good part good for the ecosystem but we've created our own little you know copy and paste new york all around the country which doesn't work so uh yeah thanks that's what i just wanted to say thanks thanks so much for coming on uh any advice do you have for young people who are passionate about creating um healthier environments like through like humans like becoming stewards you know rather than just continuing the same process of ripping holes and then having to repair them with with you know what i mean yeah yeah, I think I think that there are so many awesome local organizations like the Boulder Watershed Collective and many others where people can connect and be active locally. And I feel like doing something on the land um, is one way that I alleviate my own like climate anxiety. And I feel like that that is a really good way for people to feel like they are doing something. Um, and I think there's so many opportunities for that all over the place. And um, I, th I think we have to be doing, the more people we can get involved, the better we'll all be. And, and hopefully I agree, like putting ourselves out of business would be the ultimate achievement. So yeah. um, hopefully we get there someday. Yeah. Can you conceptualize a system that we create where, that something like that happens where we actually really l create a restorative like economy. I just, just throwing right. that out. I mean, yes, I, that is, I think that is reconceptualizing ourselves as part of nature instead of dominant nature. Mm -hmm. And if we were able to do that, like on a larger scale collectively as a community, I think that we would not be overconsumptive the way that we are. You know, we would be living more in harmony with what we need versus everything that we can have. And that would dramatically reduce our impacts on the landscape. And um, so, yeah, I think re envisioning how we are part of nature is really important for us to be doing. Totally. I mean, I think we kidding, we're kidding ourselves if we think that we're dominating nature because it will just adapt and then eat us up and then, you know, continue on on its geological scale. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nature will yeah. be fine. Yeah, nature will be fine. I think we'll be fine, too, because of people like you and keeping the conversation going. So like I said, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the work you're doing. I'd love to talk again sometime. Yes. Thank you for your work. Also, appreciate My pleasure. it. All right, everybody. And of course, we will see you next week. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Changing the Climate. Here at Climate Change Realty, we don't just donate 50% of our net commissions to fight climate change. We also donate a full 50% of our real estate referrals. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.